Schiller and welcome back to the principles of training. The principle I want to talk about today is the principle of work with the horse you have today or you could even call this principle work with the horse you have right now. I think a lot of people have trouble with their, their horse training or their getting along with their horses because they have this thing that's called expectation and uh, to paraphrase Shakespeare expectation is the mother of all frustration and I'm sure all of you at some point of time have been frustrated with your horse because he he won't do what you want or yesterday he was doing it why won't he do it today and you just have to remember training horses that you know horses live moment to moment and we kind of have to do that too uh, not only for as far as training purposes but especially for safety sake I really hear of a lot of people that have an accident with their horse um, you know maybe uh, one recently a lady said uh, I had this accident with my horse we were trail riding my horse bucked me off and I said well how was he at the start of the whole ride you know was he the same quiet horse he was yesterday she goes well no he he, he wasn't I was saddling him up and he wouldn't stand still but my friend was waiting for me to go for a trail ride with him so I I just kind of hurried through that bit and off I went and those little signs those horses give you that things aren't quite right or the horse has not been the same as yesterday, you really have to be in the moment to do that. So if you get your horse out and he's normally quiet, but you get him out and all of a sudden one day he's, he's running around, running all over the top of you, whatever, you would want to stay in the moment right there and get that solved before you went to the next thing. So let's talk about the work with your horse you have today principle. Uh, from a safety aspect. You know, recently I was reading an article, I saw an article online, and the headline of the article was, freak accident with horses, not likely. And I thought, well, I, I'm gonna read this, I agree with this person, because I don't think most accidents with horses are freak accidents, they're just people missing the things that led up to the accident. The accident did not come out of nowhere. And so I went on to read the article and was surprised to find that the author of the article was actually had the actual total opposite view from what I had. I think that most accidents are avoidable and they're not freak accidents, they're, they're things that were missed. Whereas this person said, there are no freak accidents with horses because a freak accident is an accident you're not expecting. If you ride horses, you should expect accidents. You should expect spooking, bucking, bolting, rearing, getting run over. That's just a part of everyday thing with horses because horses are unpredictable. And she went on to give her example of what a freak accident would be. And she cited a thing that happened to the male model, Fabio. If you remember Fabio, he was, the, he was the cover of a lot of romance novels. And Fabio was on a roller coaster somewhere. And while he was on the roller coaster, traveling at high speed, a duck flew by and the duck hit Fabio in the face. And in the article, there was a picture of Fabio in a roller coaster. You know, when you have the screen, the, you know, you come down the roller coaster and you wave like this and it takes a picture got one of those pictures and Fabio has got his nose blood all over his face and blood all over his face from being hit in the face by a duck on the roller coaster. And she was saying that is a freak accident. Horse riding accidents are not freak accidents. And I had to agree with her that that was a freak accident, but only if there was no signs warning you that that might happen. But let's say at that particular roller coaster, there's a sign there that says this roller coaster is, is located next to a swamp. And during the months of May and June, the ducks are migrating from that swamp. And beware on this roller coaster, you may encounter a flying duck. Then it would not be a freak accident. It would be, well, I kind of half expected it because it, you know, I saw the sign and I thought, nah, I'm still gonna get on the roller coaster. And I really think it's the same with horses. People will tend to 
miss the signs and not read those read those signs and a lot of times that comes from not being mentally present with your horse not paying attention to what your horse is doing today versus what your horse was doing yesterday and, and like i said a minute ago i said there was a lady that you know she said she had an accident on a trail ride but in retrospect her horse was not behaving the way he normally behaves and she ignored that because she was expecting her horse to be the same horse today as he was the day before so i've mentioned in earlier episodes that as we go along with all these principles of training the principles start to overlap and one principle might encompass several other principles i also mentioned earlier in the start of this one that expectation is the mother of all frustration and if you remember back to the donkey kong principle you know the donkey kong principle i, I got it from video games it goes just like video games you start the video game you go along and if you die you go back to the start and you go along a bit further and you die you go back to the start and every time you turn that video game video game on you have to start in the beginning and i think when if you're training horses sticking to the Donkey Kong principle will stop you from having expectations and frustrations because for me personally if I'm working with a you know with a young horse every day I start out I'm going to start out at the very beginning do you remember the thing we taught you the first day oh good you remember the thing we taught you the second day oh good you remember the thing and go on and, and you could probably take you know I know in the past probably what I've taught a horse in the first it's taken me two weeks to teach that horse by the time he gets good at that I can get out and I can go through that two weeks work in about two minutes and what that does it just it tells me that this horse is ready to go to the next step and so I don't have any surprises and I'm working with the horse I have today if I get a horse out and I'm planning on going through the first two weeks worth of work and see how long it takes if they're good with it, like I said, it might take me two minutes. But if I get to the third thing and we're stuck on that today, I don't go, oh, well, he used to, he used to know it. I'm going to go ahead. Because if you remember in those earlier episodes, everything you were teaching the horse now provides the answers to the problems that are going to come up later on, which is the they need to know the answer before you ask the question principle and the create a tool before you use a tool. If you can go back at the start and do that Donkey Kong principle and work your way through every day you get your tools to where they are really really solid and also it gives you the answers to any problems you may be going to encounter during the day's session i had a really good example of work with the horse you have today at a clinic a few years ago a lady came to one of my clinics and she's a, a professional trainer does a very very good job training horses and at the start of the clinic she came in with her horse who's an old broke horse she's had him for years and she's on a halter and lead broke and i said you don't really want to do groundwork do you you know i don't think there's anything i can teach you with your groundwork and she said well i'd just like you to take a look at it i said sure i can take a look at it so she showed me her groundwork and this lady spends a lot of time doing groundwork and teaches her horse probably way more things than i actually teach mine she can do a lot of stuff for the horse and to me it all looked great there wasn't a thing that she asked a horse to do he didn't do really well and so when she got done showing me all that i said she said to me so what do you think and i said well it's not really important about what i think you know what you're talking about what do you think and she said well it's all right but it just used to be a little bit snappier he he used to um just respond with a little more energy to probably a little more subtle of a cue and i said okay so you'd like to fix that she said yeah i think i'd like to work on that and i said oh, okay well tell me how did you get him to where he was very responsive to subtle cues in the first place and she said well i, I would always you know if i didn't get the response i want i would follow through i would if you if you cast your mind back to the principle of training episode that was called the application of your aids how i talked about how one thing turns into another turns into another until you get the response you want I asked her, you know, she said that's basically what she did. She would ask subtly and she would escalate until she got the response she wanted and then she would quit asking. And I said, so, okay, so if you want to make that better, why aren't you escalating now? And she said, well, I got to where I didn't have to. And I looked at her and I said, but you never don't have to. You have to be working with your horse in that moment. If your horse doesn't give you the response that you're after, you need to keep your pressure escalating till you get the response and then quit. If you ask and you get the response you want, you can quit then and it's, and it's a moment to moment basis. And she looked at me right then and she went, duh, she, I mean, she knows this stuff. She's really, really good at what she does, but she 
just overlooked that principle and she looked at me and she said I teach this to people all the time how could I not see it so if you've ever been in that situation yourself fall into that trap of not working with the horse you have today don't feel bad I mean even really really good trainers can have it happen to them too I've mentioned in earlier episodes that as we go have gone along with the principles of training that a lot of times a new principle introduced is actually encompassing some of the previous principles and the principle of work with the horse you have today basically encompasses all of the previous principles. If you think about the don't go to bed angry principle, if your horse gets up and worried, you've got to get them back down. You've only got to get them back down if they get up and worried. If they're not up and worried, you don't have to go through the process. Maybe you had to go through the day before to get them back down. Uh, if you think about the do the opposite principle, you know, if I was, there's an exercise I do in a lot of young horses when I'm riding them around and I'll just turn loose them and let them go wherever they want to go. And if they lean off to the left, I'll then steer them off to the right. If they lean off to the right, I'll then steer them off to the left. And what they end up doing, they end up quite straight in the middle. But you're only correcting what's going wrong. So just because the day before they went left a lot and you had to steer right a lot, you wouldn't come out today and just automatically steer right. You, would, you are correcting the thing that is going on right now, not the thing that was going on yesterday. Uh, another principle was choose where you work and choose where you rest. And if you remember with that young filly in that episode, she came down this end of the arena, she walked down this end of the arena and we picked up the trot here. And because we kept picking up the trot down here, she ended up migrating to that end of the arena. But if we kept doing that the same every day, pretty soon our horse would be stuck against that end of the arena and wouldn't come down this end. So you really would have to think about working with the horse you have today in that principle. So I mentioned before about a lady at a clinic whose horse was not as snappy maybe, not as crisp as it used to be. And the answer to that was using the principle of work with the horse you have today, lay it on top of the principle of the application of your aids. If you think about the, uh, the principle of isolate, separate, recombine, you're only isolating and separating the thing that's not working today or in this very moment actually they're the only thing that you're going to separate that fix it put it back together but if you keep doing the same if you keep separating the same thing and fixing that pretty soon you'll end up with the opposite problem which encompasses the anticipation your best friend or your worst enemy and so all of these principles it's all about keeping your horse balanced and responding to what's going on right now. You know, that whole anticipation to best friend or your worst enemy and do the opposite, they are, they are very closely related. But in order to get all of those principles to work, you have to be really mentally present and working on what is happening right now in front of you instead of working on what your horse did 10 minutes ago or 10 days ago. So even though this principle is called work with the horse you have today, there's probably an underlying principle behind that that is so important for every single principle we've covered so far and that is being mentally present being in the moment and responding to what's going on that's what the work with your horse to, you have today principle is all about but every other principle that we've covered you need to be mentally present to do that and it doesn't really matter if you just like to ride your horse around casually or you're quite a competitive rider being present is necessary for all those things. If you're a really competitive rider, you cannot tell what diagonal you're on if you're not present in the moment. You can't tell what lead you're on through your seat if you're not present in the moment. Um, and as I've mentioned before, a lot of times people will have trouble if they go out trial riding or hacking out, as they call it in England, with their horses and they're, they're mentally getting their horse ready to go on the trial ride, but they're mentally already on that trial ride and they miss some of those flying duck signs as you might say before they get out there and all that involves being mentally present. There's an old Ray Hunt saying that says they know when you know and they know when you don't and I struggled for a long time to understand that saying and then I read an article by someone who'd worked with Ray Hunt quite a bit and he was talking about noticing what your horse is doing with his ears with his eyes, with his muzzle, with his lips, where his feet are placed, if he has tension in his back or not, what his tail's doing. You know, you need to, you need to know what all those parts of your horse are doing because they know when you know and they know when you don't. So horses basically can tell when you are present or not. And I see 
I do a lot of clinics and I see people struggling with their horses probably in two ways. One way is they're not present at all. They'll be standing there talking to me and make the horses run over them. They're not really aware of what their horse is doing at any point in time. And your horse can tell you're not aware. And I think when you are not aware like that, it really impacts your horse. I was in um, Kenya last year doing some horse work in Kenya and I got to start where we were staying. There were herds of zebra around there. And I really got to study those herds of zebra. and. Um, if any zebra lay down and had a rest, the other zebras that were all standing around were no longer grazing. They would stand around and they weren't, they weren't really completely uptight, but they, weren't, they wouldn't put their head down and graze. If anybody was laying down, we have to stay present. We have to keep an eye out for you. And so I think horses, a lot of people struggle with um, behavioral issues with horses that it's not really a training issue it's not something you need to correct with training it's something you would need to correct with just being aware of what your horse is doing all the time and i think once they understand that you're aware they feel so much more peaceful about their surroundings and so that's that's one of the things i see at clinics a lot that when people are not aware and not present not aware of everything their horse is doing because they know when you know and they know when you don't and I think the other person, the other type of person I see is ultra aware of what their horse is doing, but they're not present. Meaning, oh, my horse is looking over there, which means, oh, he's gonna spook at that, means he's gonna jump on me. And if he jumps on me, oh, I wonder will the helicopter land here or the ambulance drive in here? Probably the helicopter because the road's kind of windy and who's gonna go? Now, if I end up in that hospital, I wonder if there's a good doctor there and who's gonna pick my kids up from school tomorrow? You know, they, they are very aware of what their horse is doing and what its attention is doing, but they're not mentally present. They're not in the moment. They are jumping ahead to all the things that, that might go wrong. And I think, you know, I've, I've been talking to some people lately. I mean, these are really, really, really good horsemen. Like, they just seem to be so talented, it's not funny. And, and a theme that pops up more and more and more is that they can almost mentally communicate with their horses. It's almost like you can mentally picture what you want your horse to do when they do it. I know that sounds really weird, but the more I think about it, and, and they're really good horsemen, okay? Um, but the more I think about it, I think the average horseman does it a lot too, but we mentally picture all the things we don't want to happen. Okay, ever been hosing your horse and you don't want him to stand on the hose and what's he doing? He's standing on the hose. We're mentally picturing, I don't want him to stand on the hose, but as they say, your mind does not take in negatives. If I say, don't drop my keys or whatever, and I hand them to you, your brain registers drop the keys. And so I think it's very, very important that we, we don't do all that mental picturing of what we don't want to happen. And we try to keep our mind on what we do want to happen. And there's a, uh, a story I've heard about a, uh, a martial arts camp that someone went to that's relative to this. And um, it was one of the UFC things. They fight in the octagon. And this guy went to this martial arts camp for the weekend and they were gonna be there for an hour, Friday afternoon, and then all day Saturday and Sunday. And these guys went into the octagon Saturday, uh, Friday afternoon and there was a, a beam about 10 feet, about three meters long, laying on the floor of the uh, octagon. And it was probably six inches square. What would that be? 15 centimeters square. And the guy, the instructor had everybody line up and said, OK, I want you just guys to walk across the beam. So everybody walked across the beam like that. He said, now do it again. Now do it again. Now do it again. And initially these guys thought it was a warm-up exercise, but that's all they did for an hour. At the end of the hour, the instructor goes, OK, off you go. We'll see you in the morning. And they were not very happy UFC fighters because they wanted to do some of this stuff. You know what I mean? So the next morning they came back in the octagon and that same beam was in there. But he'd erect, the instructor had erected it on scaffolding and it was now about 10 feet, about 3 metres, off the floor of the octagon. And their job for the morning was to climb up the scaffolding and walk across the beam. And nobody could walk across the beam because they were no longer mentally present. They were not focusing on the beam, they were focusing on the drop and they'd get all the wobbles and fall off. And they'd spent an hour walking across that beam the day before and when they walked across the beam, they were focusing on the beam. The next day the beam was exactly the same except there was something that they shouldn't be focusing on off to the side and they all focused on that. And so I tell that at clinics a lot because I think when we focus on the things we don't want to happen, they tend to happen way more than what we do want to happen.
So I really think we all get into horses because we love horses. And then as we go on, we either want to solve problems or refine things. And I think in order to do those, we have to make some changes within ourselves. So this whole horse journey is really a personal development journey that's guided by your love for horses. And I really think that that principle of being present is probably the most important one because it gets rid of all your anger, your frustrations and your worries and all those things that get in the way of, of training horses. So this episode is the, the end of all the principles of training and the, in future episodes what we're going to do is we're going to show you um, real life situations training horses and, and explaining what principle we're using and why we're doing a certain thing because it applies to a certain principle. So hopefully you join us next time and we'll see more of the principles of training.